MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram MPOX update. Moderna's first mRNA MPOX vaccine beats licensed rivals shots in early testing. You knew it was only a matter of time before we saw an mRNA version of the vaccine for MPOX. I thought it would be a good time to update what's going on in terms of MPOX and the vaccine situation. I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm the co-founder with Kyle Allred of MedCram, where we have continuing medical education videos and so much more. Please visit us at medcram.com. All right, so let's talk about what's going on here. We talked in our previous updates about the WHO declaring a public health emergency of international concern. And as we discussed, it was really to mobilize the international effort to try to keep this under control. So what's happened since that time? Here is a recent article that talks about how just now the first doses of MPOX vaccines are arriving where they are needed the most. And we'll talk more about which vaccines those are and a little bit more about the three now different types of potential vaccines that are being looked at for MPOX. So why did it take so long to get those vaccines over to Africa? Read this article if you want. I'll put a link to it in the description. But basically, it's a bunch of red tape. You have to have the countries willing to donate. You have to have the countries willing to declare an emergency. The WHO, which is overlooking it, has to make sure they're okay with the vaccines as well. So here's a little portion of that article. It says here, up till June 27, Congo's regulatory body, and that's, by the way, where we're seeing most of this right now in terms of clade one, which is the more dangerous one. It's in the Congo. They had not authorized MPOX vaccines for use. And even after that was done, donations from the United States have been held up waiting for the Congolese government to finalize pre-shipment requirements, including proper storage and handling of the vaccines once they arrived. This is in this article here from NPR. They say that the other path for vaccines to get into the country is through the WHO. Many low- and middle-income countries defer to the WHO to assess the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine since they don't have their own regulatory body. But the WHO has not given its blessing to any of the MPOX vaccines. So any of the ones that we're going to talk about today, they haven't given their blessing to any of them, which are relatively new. Some public health specialists say this should have been done back when the U.S. and Europe health authorities allowed the vaccines to be used during the 2022 global MPOX outbreak. WHO, for its part, says that it is now reviewing the vaccines, but until very recently didn't have a complete enough information to make an official decision. Now that the drug companies have submitted all the data and information, quote, we're working to review these applications as fast as possible, unquote, says Tedros. So it sounds like the delays are related to basically red tape. On the other hand, you could look at it and say that they're doing their due diligence, that they don't want to rush things to make sure that they're not causing any harm unnecessarily. And of course, the latter is exactly what the WHO is saying. They said, basically, we're not rushing anything. Let's update the facts about what's going on. I want to tell you about the three different types of vaccines, but before I do, I wanted to just completely disclose that I have no relationship financially with either Emergent Biosolutions, Bavarian Nordic, or Moderna, or any other drug company for that matter. So what I'm about to tell you today is just based on the data, the evidence, and the facts. Let's talk about this one here, the Emergent Biosolutions product, otherwise known as ACAM 2000. This is the oldest one, the one that's been around the longest, and it is a live virus, and it's based on the virus Vaccinia. This is one of the first viruses that was the basis of the very first vaccine against smallpox. Smallpox is a disease that is based on the variola virus and it can have up to a 30% mortality. This is in Europe, 30% mortality. This ACAM 2000 was specifically designed as a vaccine against smallpox. When the United States government saw smallpox as potentially a bioterrorism agent, it stockpiled quite a lot of ACAM 2000. So how does it work? It uses not variola, but vaccinia, which is in the same family as MPOX. Let's review MPOX and Vaccinia and Variola, all in the same family, the orthopox viruses. As a result of that, vaccination against one does confer immunity against the other. The way that they were planning on getting immunity against smallpox was using the virus Vaccinia, which is not nearly as virulent. 
and they would actually inject it into people's arms, and they would do it multiple times with multiple cuts, if you will, into the skin to make sure that it quote-unquote takes. The way you know whether it took, in other words, whether or not you became infected with vaccinia, is you would see little pox forms at the site of vaccination. Once that happens, then you know that you are immune to vaccinia and therefore immune to smallpox. So that's great that you can do that. The problem is, is that it's not a very clean vaccine. Some estimates are that one in 175 people who get this vaccine actually get myopericarditis. That may seem like a lot, but again, if you were to have a bioterrorism situation where 30% of the people are actually dead, this obviously is considered a better situation. And so ACAM 2000 is kind of a last resort situation. Also, because it's live and it replicates, you could inadvertently inoculate people with it if that were to spread to somebody else. This is one option here. It's not a great option. The United States so far has not used any of these vaccines that they've stockpiled for anybody with MPOX anywhere in the United States. We'll talk more about that. Let's go to the next one, Bavarian Nordic. They have come out with another vaccine that is also based on vaccinia. It is live, just like the ACAM 2000, but it is not replicating. Live, but not replicating. So you don't need a take. There's no shoulder that you need to put it into and make a pox that forms. The rates of myopericarditis, since this is not actually being infected, it's just basically getting the immune response, is extremely low. It is there, but it's extremely low. It's far more well tolerated. And this was also developed for vaccine against smallpox, but also has relatively good efficacy, maybe about 60 to 70% based on some numbers against mpox. And so that's why it is used. This has been the go-to vaccine in the United States in at-risk populations like we talked about in mpox, especially among the population of men who have sex with men, to vaccinate against mpox. We'll talk a little bit more about the clades in just a second here. This is what's being utilized not only for clade 2B, which is the major one that's been seen since 2022, but also now in considering clade 1B, which is expanding in Central Africa. That's where we were until just recently here. Now, Moderna has come up with another vaccine, which we'll talk more about. It's using four epitopes that are really conserved highly among all of the orthopox viruses. This could be utilized for vaccinia, if you'd ever need that, but specifically smallpox and definitely against mpox. That's really what it's being used for. And of course, this is not a live virus. It is a nucleotide type of vaccine. So it's mRNA using the lipid nanoparticles that we all have learned about since the last four years. We're going to talk a little bit more about the trial where two of these went head to head. And we're also going to talk a little bit more right now about the differences between the clades because that's important to understand. You got to understand a little bit of geography. The green area is the Western Africa clade, known as the clade 2, and this is what we had in 2022. Generally speaking, those that we've seen in the United States have a 99.9% survival. That is different than clade 1, which we see in purple, where there have been reports in the past of up to 10% mortality. More recently, as we talked about in our last update, there was a hospital where they looked at 400 hospitalizations for MPOX, and only four of those died. So not really a mortality rate, but a case fatality rate here of four out of 400, and these 400 were the sickest, and even with that, it was only four. So we're looking at about 1% case fatality rate. That could change, but certainly, as you can see, it's higher than what we were dealing with here with clade 2. So the two ones that are going on right now is clade 2B and clade 1B. This is clade 2B, comes from this general area, and clade 1B from this general area. This is spread, by the way, into the east, into four different other countries, which were included in that WHO declaration. And the only other two places so far as of this recording is in Sweden and in Thailand. Those are the two cases, and those were people that had traveled from this endemic area with clade 1B. Let's get to the actual publication. This was published in the journal Cell. The title was Comparison of Protection Against MPOX Following MRNA or Modified Vaccinia and Cara Vaccination in Non-Human Primates. So a couple of things here. The MRNA is the Moderna product. The Modified Vaccinia and Cara, by the way, is 
this one right here. They're referring to the Bavarian Nordic product, which goes under the trade name Genios, Imvamune, and Imvanex. This is in non-human primates. They're in macaques, which is exactly the primate that this was discovered in first. Let's talk about the vaccine. So here, this is known as the MVA vaccine. This is the Genios. This is the Bavarian Nordic product. And as you can see here, it is a vaccinia virus without the components that allow it to replicate. It can make 30 structural proteins. And when it does that, you get a lot of these different antibodies from the whole thing. Quite broad antibody response against the MVA virus that is in the vaccine. That's as opposed to the mRNA-1769. That's this product from Moderna. So what they did was they looked at four different proteins that were expressed across the board. They were conserved in and across the orthopox virus family. So vaccinia, smallpox, mpox, and they made targets, basically proteins from mRNA that would make these proteins. Now, some of them were on the outside of the cells that were infected. Those are the EV proteins. And some of them were on the outside of the actual virus itself, the MV proteins. This is a big difference between this effect. Here, they are targeting very specific proteins. Here, they are targeting a number of different proteins, all of which may or may not be conserved. Here's the study. Basically, what they're doing is in three different arms, in the Bavarian Nordic arm, the MVA, in the Moderna arm, the mRNA-1769, and then the PBS, which is basically the control group. They're taking macaque primates, and they are at week zero immunizing, and this is exactly the dose that they're using. And then they're taking blood at week two. At week four, they're drawing blood, and then they're giving them another booster. So by the way, this is exactly what you typically do with the MVA product. You give a second shot at 28 days. And by the way, I would just mention here that the Bavarian and Nordic is typically given subcutaneously, but there's now been FDA approval to give it at one-fifth the dose intradermally. They did not do that for this study. Just be aware that that's one way that the U.S. government has increased the effective stash, if you will, by fivefold. At week six, they draw blood. And then finally at week eight, so this is four weeks after the second shot, either of the mRNA or of the Bavarian Nordic product, Genios, they challenge them. Now, they don't challenge them in the same way that we might be challenged if we were to get mpox, which is cutaneous or even respiratory potentially with droplets. The way that they do it is actually intravenous because they wanted to speed this up. Something here that I want you to really understand about this before we look at the data on this is this is not meant to be a simulation of what would happen to a human being. This is a model that is really ramping up the mortality rates of these viruses in these macaque monkeys. First of all, they were infected intravenously, which would never be the way that somebody would get mpox. And also, these are monkey models that really exaggerate the mortality of the virus. So then the observation period begins at week eight, and it goes to week 12. That's a four-week period of time. So this is what we're going to be looking at here, these four weeks right here, this observation period here in the next few slides to see what goes on. So the first thing that we're looking at here is mortality. We look at mRNA, and we see here in the red line that none of the macaques died. For some reason, there was only five in the mRNA group. There were six in the MVA group and the other six in the control group. Notice that none of the MVA monkeys died either. So both vaccinated groups in this lethal mortality model of monkeys in mpox, which, is, which were given intravenous inoculations of mpox, none of them died. But very quickly, you can see here by day seven or day eight in the observation period post-infection, we had a very rapid decline. And there was one monkey that basically remained alive for the entire 28 days important to note is they're infecting them with clade 1. This is the one that we're currently worried about. This is the one that's had an expansion right now in 2024 with over 500 deaths, 17,000 infected, and spread into the neighboring four countries like Uganda, Rwanda, etc. And now there's been a couple of cases, one in Sweden and one in Thailand, but no further spread that we're aware of. I think they're doing good here by checking against clade 1, which is the most virulent compared to clade 2b, which has been around.
So mortality is one thing, but the other thing that we need to look at is morbidity. How many pox lesions are we dealing with here? And you can see here in the control group, if we were to add up all of the pox lesions among the six monkeys, you would see here that we're almost totaling out here at 1,600 pox lesions. Now in the vaccinated group with Bavarian Nordic, it topped out at about 600. And you can see here with the Moderna mRNA vaccine, there was probably no more than 50 or 60, as you can see here in this graph. Not only that, but if you look at the days of lesion onset to resolution, these came on much later and they lasted for much less time than, let's say, the Bavarian Nordic product or even these where they died so quickly that they couldn't even have the pox lesions for very long. You can see there with the skull and crossbones. This one here had it for a long time and actually survived. There's the one lone monkey that survived. For what it's worth, you can see the viral burden. For the control group, there was this peak and then coming down here for the mRNA, there was this decrement and then a peak and then a decrement again. Not sure what the significance of that was. They do look at it here in the serum and also in the throat swabs. What about morbidity again with weight loss? You can see mRNA did not lose weight. The Bavarian Nordic product, the Genios, did not lose weight. The monkeys that were not vaccinated did lose weight. In terms of the duration of lesion incidence, you can see that mRNA was superior to either the Bavarian Nordic product or control group. What about peak lesion numbers? We can see here that this would be considered grave disease here between these two lines. Control group had quite a number of grave lesions. Even in the vaccinated group with the live vaccinia product from Bavarian Nordic, you can see that some of them did, some of these monkeys did get into that area here. The mRNA vaccine, none of them got into that area. Peak virus burden in the blood and in the swabs, you can see similarly improvement in terms of the numbers in the mRNA vaccine. There's a number of things that you might find interesting here. There's a lot more data in the actual publication, which I'll put a link in the description. But you can see here there's IgG binding titers. There's ELISA MVA virus on day 40, lysed MVA virus on day 40, and the neutralization titers that people who are interested in that sort of thing can look at. And generally speaking, it shows exactly what you expect based on the outcomes of the trial. Because this is part of the pathway for mRNA to be FDA approved for the use of MPOX, this is going to be an industry study. And so a lot of the author contributions here, you can see here, these are the author contributions, and you can see here the declaration of interests, and you can see that a lot of these are employees of Moderna. But that would not be surprising. What we would want to see here is post-marketing if and when that comes, and that would be when it's tested by independent organizations and institutions that don't have connections to Moderna. But this is the way that this would have to be at this point. Keep that in mind. So the public emergency of international concern is ongoing right now in Africa and in a number of other countries as well. There is ongoing research. This is currently the state of the research and where it is leading. Right now, none of these vaccines are recommended for the general public in the United States, except in high-risk populations, as we mentioned before. And so again, the real purpose of this video is to educate healthcare providers, as many of our videos on MedCram are seen around the world. Thanks for joining us, and don't forget to check us out at medcram.com for more continuing medical education videos. Thanks for joining us.